Hey guys, Jared Wesley here of Live Traders, and it is that time of the week. It is lecture time, and this week's lecture topic, guys, is relevant to this market right now. Basically, the topic is how to trade in this market. I'm getting lots of emails, lots of social media comments on Jared. Oh my gosh, the VIX, the volatility index is so crazy right now. How do I handle this environment? Well, a couple comments on that. One, it depends on your style. Are you a swing trader, a core trader? Are you an intraday trader, a scalp trader, et cetera? So, et cetera. so we're gonna address that uh, in today's lecture as well. Um, but today I'm basically gonna go over all of that. So if you are a core trader, I'm going to go over the levels in which you need to be buying in into this market, not just the market, but stocks as well. Um, I'm going to also talk to scalp traders and intraday traders and how you can handle this extreme volatility that we're seeing. Guys, we're seeing two and 3% moves intraday in the market. Traditionally, a 1% move is a huge move in the market. Lately, it's like hold my beer. 1% is like a quarter of the day's range, right? So we're putting in $10 ranges, $12 ranges in the queues and the S&P 500, et cetera. So it is very choppy, very volatile. A lot of people are getting whipped around. They're chasing their tail. They're pretzel tied. So I want to address that topic. And again, it can help people on both sides of the fence because if you're an intraday trader, we are going to isolate and talk about how you can handle this environment. If you are a longer term swing or core trader, we're also going to talk about how you can take advantage of this. One of the problems, guys, is a lot of you out there are scared, right? Your fear of loss is stronger than your hope for gain. Well, that's a problem, okay? You remember back in 2008, 2009, how upset, pissed off people were at the market? Like, I'm never going to invest in the market ever again. How did that go? Didn't go so well, did it? Bet you wish you were in the Dow at 6,000, 6,500, because now it's well over 30,000. Put your money under the mattress, you're going backwards in life, okay? Especially in this high inflationary period that we're in, that's not transitory, wink, wink. Um, but the point I'm making, guys, is you need to be buying this market on the way down because the market goes up over 72% of the time historically. We're gonna address all of that in today's lecture. So if you like these videos, please click the like button, smash, hammer that subscribe button, build this account, this channel, build this account. Come on, we can do it. All right, I'm Jared Wesley of Live Traders. Let's get to it. This week's lecture topic is how to trade this market and this market's in parentheses uh, that means the current environment in which we are in uh, as you guys know it's been let's just say extremely volatile the last time a market uh, in my opinion was this volatile was 08 09 and it lasted about six months uh, of really crazy volatility uh, so far this has lasted probably since thanksgiving so about three months give or take um and um I don't know that we're going to be out of this anytime soon. You know, I, I think this volatility is here to stay for a while. Uh, when you look at the geopolitical events, when you look at the Fed, um, you know, monetary easing or they're tightening their, their balance sheet, whatever you want to call it. Um, but they're putting less money into the markets, which prop the markets up. Interest rates are a big issue right now. Inflation is a big issue. There's just a lot of economic stuff and geopolitical stuff going on. So the point being is, is, I don't think we're going to stop this volatility for a while, um, maybe the summertime. I'm not sure. Um, so that begs the question, well, how do we get through this environment? Are we just going to not trade? Are we just going to not invest? So today we're going to talk about um, the trading side of things, okay, as well as the investing side of things. Because in my opinion, anytime the market gives us a significant pullback, and when I consider significant, is it, I don't know, 20% or more, I don't, you know, 10% is okay, that's fine. But if we can get a 20, 30, 40% pullback, that's a significant pullback. Why? Because it doesn't happen all that often. And when it does happen, you want to take advantage of that environment, right? Because if you're holding something long term, or you'd like to retire someday with a lot of money, it's always nice to be able to to take advantage of a discount in the market, right? A lot of people cursed the markets back in 2008, absolutely cursed the markets. Uh, I'll never invest in the market ever again. Screw the market, F Wall Street, right? Blah, 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 blah. The Dow was at about 6,500 back then. The Dow is now currently at 33,000. So I'm gonna take a slight guess. I'm gonna just you know go on a limb here. Those folks wish they had put more money into the market in 2008 or 9 instead of taking all their money out of the market 
but the average person is usually on the wrong side of market cycles anyway. The average person, honestly, they're terrible investors. They're terrible, all right? Um, only to be slightly beaten by hedge funds who are also terrible investors. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. But before we do any of that, we must first talk about when will the insanity stop? Uh, I, have a, I have an interesting one for you guys today. Um, I still... I still at times I get shocked and surprised um, at the, the stuff that people do. Um, what would appear to be just super commonsensical uh, apparently is a rare, rare, rare superpower, the common sense thing, I mean, um, which is not that surprising. Just go people watch in the park and you realize it. Um, but nonetheless, today's is this. Now, to be clear, this person ended up making money. They made money on this, $13,000. But here's the thing. What did I do wrong? I probably should have taken their name off here. I apologize. Oh, well, it's too late now. All right. This morning, I set up what I thought was going to be a purchase of 5,000 shares of AMD at a price on the way up. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Then this person doesn't even know it, adds 5,000 shares. You did, Rob. Thank you. This person adds another 5,000 shares when they thought they were selling 5,000 shares, okay? Um, so the point simply is trading 5,000 shares of any stock, I don't care if it's a penny stock or in this case, AMD, which this is from a couple of few days ago, uh, but that's a $107 stock. Again, that's from a couple of few days ago. That's actually from yesterday. Um, and not knowing how your platform works, that's called insanity, okay? I'm gonna repeat it because it's really important. Trading 5,000 shares of any stock and not knowing how your platform works is called insanity. So I can't think of a great analogy. The only one I can think of is, let's imagine you just bought a new car. And I know, I know, I know, this would likely never happen. Imagine you got into that car and you didn't know where the brake pedal was. You only knew where the gas pedal was. That's insanity taking that car out on the road, isn't it? Because you don't know how to stop. You only know how to go. Okay, so when you look at this and you're like, wait, wait a second, uh, I use, you know, think or swim or whatever, all this other, but how can you be trading half a million dollar positions and not know how your platform works? And in this case, it ended up being a million dollar position because this person ultimately had 10,000 shares of this, right? 10,000 shares of this thing. Okay, so it was over a million dollar position. If you're not sure how that specific order is placed, you try that order with one share, 10 shares, 100 shares, something very small and comfortable till you understand how that specific type of order is used, whether it's an OCO order, an OSO order, a limit order, a stop market order, a stop limit, doesn't care what it is. What are you doing? Do you realize how badly this could have gone for you? Because if you don't know how to place the order, it also means you probably don't know how to place the stop loss either because you had 10,000 and you tried to get five. So you had double the shares that you wanted because it bought when you thought it was selling. Da, 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 da. What are you doing? I know it was a dumb mistake. No, it's a freaking stupid, idiotic mistake. What if that had really gone against you? What if in this volatile market, it's very possible, news comes out and all of a sudden AMD tanks and goes down $5, which on a $100 stock is not insane. You're down 50K now, my man. Stupid, what are you doing? You know what I mean? So my point to you guys is, for the love of God, take this business seriously. Treat it like a business. Don't treat it like some passing thing. This is how people bag hold. This is how people lose significant amounts of money. So what could have happened to this person? They don't take the stop loss or they thought they were getting out when in fact they doubled their position. It keeps going against them, keeps going against them. Like, no, no, I can't get out. I'm going to lose too much. So they bag hold. And in this market, we've seen days where the market's down 3%. AMD goes down 3%. The next day, another few percent. And all of a sudden, you're down 100 grand for no good reason. Just don't do it. If you're learning a new order type and you're not sure about it, either test it in the simulator or take a trade or two on very small risk. Learn how that order entry or stop loss or bracket works and then apply it to your normal risk level. You, sir, are a gambler or have no common sense. I don't want to use the other word. You're one of those two things.
So I hope the rest of you will learn from this. This is insane. I mean, it's just egregiously foolish. But it's how the market goes. This is what people do out there. All right. So let's move along. All right. So don't get it twisted. I used that line last week. Don't get it twisted. Know your support and resistance levels and the market cycle. You see a theme here. Do you guys remember a couple weeks ago we talked about the basic market cycle? Do you guys remember this slide? I think you probably do. This is the second or third week in a row that I've put this slide in here. There's a reason. I'm, there's a general bigger picture I'm getting at here. No, I'm not going to sit here and go crazy on this particular slide today because, well, we've already done this slide. Right. So it's the only movement that's possible. Right. We have ambivalence, greed, indecision and fear. OK. So right now we've talked about it. We are between this indecision and fear phase. And to be quite honest, we're more in the fear phase. Right. We're more close to the stage four on the daily chart. Um, but again, I want to do a couple things. All right. I want to liken this to the market we're in now. So we're going to look at the current market chart here in just a couple of minutes. The Q's and the SPY. We're going to take a look at a weekly chart of the Q's and the SPY currently. All right. But before we do that, I wanted to add a little bit of levity to it. It's serious levity. Like it's funny, but you know, it's serious. So this is I added the captions. OK, this is from Dr. Jean-Paul Rodriguez, Department of Economics and Geography at Hofstra. That's the person who gets credit for this particular picture, just not the the other pictures that I threw in here. <laughs> OK, so I want you to look at this in this light. Because when you look at it back, let me go back a slide. When you look at it like this, it can be a little bit sterile or disconnected. And you're like, oh, it's just a line, Jared, whatever. It's just a line, whatever, right? But when you start internalizing or making it more humanized, right, it becomes a bit more real. And those emotions you can kind of relate to because we've all probably been there. So you go over here, the stealth phase, right? This is the smart money, like the actual smart money. I don't mean hedge funds, okay? This is Congress, senators, people in government that, why do I say that? No, it's not a political statement. They have legalized inside information. It's, le it's legal for them. <laughs> I don't know how, okay? I don't know how you can be on the financial oversight committee and own stock in the company in which you're overseeing, but that's the way our government works these days. And both parties do this and it's legal. My point is, that's the genuinely smart money. I mean, honestly, guys, Nancy Pelosi makes Warren Buffett blush with her returns. I mean, Warren Buffett wishes he had the returns that Nancy Pelosi somehow gets. Um, I'm half joking on that, but you get the point, right? So don't worry about this because you're never going to be this. You're just not, all right? Unless you happen to make it to Congress or Senate or something like that, all right? Um, so then the stock starts to take off a little bit, right? Starts to move higher. The beginning phases of this move up are where institutional investors get in. Right. So you have your Gordon Geckos, the world, and of course, other investors, you know, that maybe have an inside track. Maybe they're next door neighbors to Nancy. Maybe they're good friends. Who knows? But they're kind of in that secondary category. Right. Institutional investors. Um, and then the market starts to move up a little bit more. And once you get to about, oh, I don't know, the, the position between halfway up and three quarters of the way up somewhere around there to where more than half of the move has already been taken, that's when the general public gets in. Good traders are going to get in between institutional investors and the public. Why? Because these people over here to the left, they have inside information. They, they know stuff nobody knows. Nobody knows. Okay. So a good chart reader will get in between the institutional and the public. If you're getting in when the public gets in, you're late to the party, but not fashionably late, just late. OK, so the public gets in, you're up 50 percent, not 50 percent, but 50 percent of the move, 75 percent of the move. Like you're a good ways up there. Right. And then it continues to go higher. Think of the meme stocks, GME and AMC. And heck, even BBBY is turning into a meme stock these days. All right. And, you, and then as it moves up, you say to yourself on this little yellow dot. Yeah, gosh, I knew I should have bought more of this thing. I just knew it. I knew this thing was going to go on. My Uber driver told me and he had the inside track because his uncle's cousin's sister's brother's dog barked at Tim Cook and Tim Cook barked back and the dog relayed the message. Apple goes higher. I knew I should have bought more. Right. And then Apple goes higher. Tesla goes higher. Right. And then you say to yourself, man, I am. I'm really good, but you know what? I'm not getting out this time. 
You know, because last time I got out and the stock went higher and higher. And my buddy, that one in a million buddy friend that I have, or at least a guy I heard of, I have never even met the guy, but I heard he exists. You know, he's retired now. You know, he, he bought that Tesla stock or GME stock or whatever the heck it was, and, and he's retired now. So, you know what? I want to kind of want to be retired too. So I'm, I'm, I'm not getting out. Even though for us chart readers, right, the charts look in climactic. This is when you get that big topping tail, huge volume spike, right? All of the signs that a pullback is coming. The average person just sits there, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da and they just let the stock pull back. Oh, I should add more, right? Pulls back, maybe they add more. It bounces after the ad, so it's above the ad, and like, see, I was right. They're justifying all the way down. Starts to pull back a little bit more. Indecision, should I add? Because this isn't feeling as good as it used to feel. And, you know, I, I got in down here, but I added twice, and now I'm on actually underwater because of my ads. Well, because you're not reading the chart. You're living in hopium. You don't have a plan. You're just a gambler, which is why I always find it fascinating when the general public likes to call traders gamblers. Well, there are certainly some traders that act like gamblers, but if you have an entry, exit, and target, an entry, a stop loss, and a target, how could you be considered a gambler? That's more than most institutional investors have, right? They're all drinking the hopium. Point is, is as the stock continues lower and lower and lower, now they're starting to what? They're starting to give up. But unfortunately, they still hang on to a thread of hope. And unfortunately, that thread of hope ends up costing them a lot more money. Instead of getting out up here for a small loss, right? They sit there and they're like, you know what? The chance of this thing coming back is pretty slim, but I'm not a loser until I sell it. I'm not a loser until I get out of it. So they hold on and it keeps going lower and lower and lower. And then during this move down from this yellow dot to this one down here, it's what? It's scour the internet time. It's, hey, Google, what are the fundamentals on this company? Hey, when's the next earning? Oh my gosh, is the CEO going to retire? Did Goldman Sachs upgrade or downgrade this stock? What do my neighbors think about all this? Hey, do you know anything about blah, blah, blah? You are lit. That's like your homework phase. Why? Because you want to, you're trying to hold on to that sliver of hope. Maybe it will bounce. Maybe it will bounce. But most of your being knows it's not going to happen like that, but maybe it will, okay? So, it keeps going lower, and then you finally get to what we call the pain point. The pain point is when you can't take it anymore, and you're like, F this, I am out. F Wall Street, I'm selling. And that's just about the time, a little bit after, it starts to come back up. And this is the phase or the cycle of the market. Now, why am I showing you this, guys? You're like, Jared, that's nice. We talk about the market's basic atom all the time because if you don't understand this and you don't understand the emotions behind it, one, you will never take advantage of bear markets. You will only always buy on the way up and you'll never figure out a way to buy on the way down. No, I'm not talking about cost averaging, losing positions. We are traders, okay? But what I'm getting at is, when these big pullbacks do happen, like 2008 or 2016, you're going to be able to get an opportunity to take advantage of the market. But most people are too fearful and too scared to do so. And this is why the average investor over the last 10 years has returned 2.9% when the market has returned 14 to 15%. Think about that. Because you do the exact opposite of what you should be doing. You have heard that in real estate, when there's blood in the street, it's time to buy. Well, so I'm bringing this up because you might think, well, that's, that's very cute, Jared. That's nice of you to say. Hindsight's 2020, my man. It's always easy in hindsight, isn't it? Well, this is from 2020. Okay, see it? This is from March, 2020. The video is still online, still on YouTube. You can go back and check. Timestamp it, if you will. But this is a monthly chart that I brought up of the market at the time. COVID times, February, March, April of 2020, okay, is when this was brought up. And I gave you guys four possible levels, 233, 181, 167. Now, obviously, 67 would have been pretty ugly, all right? First level was taken out pretty nicely, okay? Then, 
SPY went a little bit lower, went actually bottomed out at 218.26. We never even really got to the second level. Now, why would I do this? Because guys, if you're not putting levels on your chart, especially for long-term investments, how are you gonna know the buy areas if we do have a correction, if we do have a pullback? How are you gonna know? You're just gonna wake up one day and say, oh, I think this is a good spot to buy the market? That's gambling, okay? Now, as you guys know, I am a huge proponent of taking 20% of your income and putting it into a total market fund every month. And I think that's a wonderful idea, all right? But when you get unique situations, unique periods in time like 08, 09, like COVID, like what we're going through right now, you need to take advantage of it, right? You need to take advantage of it because they don't happen that often. All right, I'm going to skip ahead and I'm going to come back for a second. I wasn't planning on skipping this far ahead, but I'm going to come back. When I say they don't happen that often, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? They don't happen that often. 2008, the market was down 33%. 2000, 00, 1 and 2, ooh, 6%, not a big deal. 7, not 16, probably can take advantage of that. Guys, when's the last time, other than 08, the market in the last 40 years, 40 years, when's the last time the market was down more than 15, 20%? The answer is none. You had two opportunities in 40 years to take advantage of a 15 or more percent pullback. Two times in 40 years. Twice. Now, I'm not saying during this, there weren't opportunities. 1987, you had what, a 10, 12% pullback, something like that in the middle of the year. So I'm not suggesting that during in the middle of some of these years, perhaps the market was down 10 or 15 or more percent. But the point you get, it does not happen very often. Okay, it does not happen very often. So when it does, stop being such big puss bags. Man up, person up, girl up, whatever you want to call it, and buy it because it's going to come back because it always comes back. And the day it doesn't, you have far bigger problems in your bank account. Trust me. Okay? So stop being so damn scared when the market pulls back. When the market pulls back, your eyes should go wide open and go, thank you. Please drop some more. Please drop some more. I want to buy, 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 buy all the way down. Okay? Now, what if you drew those lines in 2008? What if you drew the same lines? You would have hit three or four. You would have hit every level, basically, you could have drawn because the last level would have been down here at 67, just above it, and you would have bought some more. How would you have felt there? Yeah, you'd be up 600%. Imagine that. 12, 13 years, 600%. So, let's draw current levels. Let's draw current levels. Okay? We'll take a look at the Qs on the weekly, the NASDAQ 100. Take a look at the SPY on the weekly, the S&P 500. So I drew a few more levels this time. I drew five levels. One of them is kind of an in-between level, right? Because it's this double bottom pivot, but we also have another pivot at 300 that's close by. I don't know about you guys, but I already added at 350, okay? Now, I added on the SPY, so we'll get to that in a second. But on this pullback, the equivalent version on the SPY, I already added, okay? But down here, I added some more. All right, we haven't gotten to the next level yet. And if we do, I'll add some more. And I, honest opinion, I think we get down there. Do I think we're going to get down to 260? I doubt it. I don't necessarily want us to get to 170, but if we did, I'd be buying up huge amounts of the market. We've already hit one level. We've already hit the second level. Now it's just a matter of hitting a third level down here. This one would be kind of nice at 260. I'm not sure we're going to get there. Right, I'm not sure we're going to get there. From the top at like, what is that, 408 or something like that, down to 260, that's a $148 move. Uh, that would be what, somewhere in the 30-some percent range? That would be a pretty significant pullback. Now remember, the market could end the year above 400. I don't care how it ends the year. I just care in the middle of the year how I can take advantage of the pullback. All right? So I'm going to skip to the SPY because this is what I base my buying mainly on, Okay. Um, this one is a range, and this is why these two lines are here. Why? Because this is the top, right? Remember, the ceiling becomes the floor. So this is the bottom of this pivot, but the top of this area. We've already peekabooed under. I've already added 
some here, okay? We've gotten very close to the 400 area with this bottoming tail, all right? Now we're sitting at like 426, something like that. I'm fairly confident we're going to hit 400, all right? Will we hit 350? Possibly, right? 350 from the high. I think, what is the high, guys, on the market? Was it... Uh, 460 or something, or sorry, 480, something like that, 479, something, I think it's 480 is the high. So my point is pulling back to 400, right, is only about a 20% pullback. That's not that big of a deal. It's just not, okay? In the grand scheme of things, a 20% pullback is not that big of a deal, okay? So I would love to see us hit the 350 range. OK, I would really be I'd be a fan of that because that would be one hundred and thirty dollar drop and that'd be about 30 percent. That That's a nice quality pullback. All right. And some of you out there, I don't want to see that happen. Guys, don't worry. It's going to come back up. Don't worry. Stop being fearful. You are broke because you're thinking counterproductively. When the market pulls in, your eyes go wide and go, yes, please give me more. Yes, more of that, please. Right? When the markets go to the moon, it's like, whoa, back off. Continue to put your money in every month, of course. But you need to be buying on the way down for your long-term investments. Not when it hits all-time highs and then add. Remember, don't be a fool. This is what they want you to do. They, all, they want you to just buy up here all the time. Buy on some of the pullbacks. Because I'm telling you again, for the 50th time, the day the market stops going higher, you have far bigger concerns, all right? Far bigger concerns, okay? So those are your levels. Two, three years from now, like we did the last one, right? The last slide I showed you was from two years ago, almost exactly two years ago. Two years from today, 2024, March, we will revisit this and we will see where the SPY is at. My guess is it's going to be above 500, perhaps significantly. Time will ultimately tell. If it's not, we'll deal with it at the time. But my point is, is take advantage of these pullbacks. They don't happen that often. We just saw it. Two times in 40 years has the market closed down more than 15%, twice in 40 years. Yeah, it's pretty rare. Guys, you do the same exact thing with stocks. Well, I'm not just talking about the market. Maybe you want to build a position into Tesla. Maybe you want to build a position, um, I don't know, into Microsoft or Apple or some other company. You do the same thing. All right, so I'm late to the party. There's no question I'm late to the Tesla party, but I'm trying to build a mediocre position in Tesla mainly for my kids' future, but I'm trying to build a position into Tesla. So I added right here, which is about $900 right there on Tesla. I added right down here at the $800 mark. And I also added a little more, which is kind of no man's land. I added a little more, just over 700, 711. If Tesla happens to come down here, and again, this is a range. We could pull this line down to here, right? We could pull it up to here, but this is your range on Tesla. All right. So if Tesla gets between these areas, you want to think about adding some. If it gets down here, I don't know why these lines are off a little bit. They should be kind of right in that range. Anyway, you want to consider adding. Now, again, I'm talking about longer term positions. I'm not. This to me isn't going to be a trade per se. It's going to be a longer term position. But if the market does pull in, Tesla is probably going to get drugged down with the market. And again, I'm not just talking about Tesla. It could be Apple. It could be Amazon. It could be Facebook. It could be Google. I don't really care what it is. Okay. But draw your levels, okay? Draw your levels on the chart. Why? Because if you understand the market cycle, this is a 30-minute chart, so we're going to kind of pivot a little and talk a little bit about lower time frames. Because everything you see on a higher time frame also happens on a lower time frame, right? So what you see in a daily happens on a five-minute as well. So when we talk about drawing levels, you're going to draw levels on a five-minute chart. You're going to draw levels on a 30 minute or a 60 minute chart. It's, the concept does not change, right? So when you see those levels being broken, it's time to take advantage. So in this particular case, remember earlier we talked about the smart money and the dumb money, right? Um, and where most people are. Well, by the time this stock gets back to 11 or 12 or $13, that's when the average person starts to get in. 
The smart person sees, wow, this is an extended downtrend. You see this huge move from nine down to four, 450, right? That's, that's your first sign. You see the stock's grinding lower, okay. But then you see this day come in and you get crushed. Like, damn, that hurt. But you can't just buy it at the bottom unless you think it's truly climactic, which is a dangerous thing on penny stocks, okay? But anyway, they move back up. And what do we get? We get the first break of our trend line. We get the first break of our trend line. Remember, from previous lessons, the first break of a trend line is not an actionable event. It's a warning sign. It's a warning sign. The warning is buyers are starting to step up more frequently than they did before. And there is a good chance, although not guaranteed, there's a good chance the next pullback will put in a higher low. That's what we want to see. We want to see the next pullback put in an equal or a higher low. Well, this stock does another 100% retracement, okay? Shallow bounce, retest. So it's a third time it retests. You could argue this is a retest and this is a retest. And then it bounces back up, pulls back, and then it gives you this. So is this slightly more aggressive? It is a little bit, right? A little bit. But now that we have a triple bottom, and we're putting in a higher pivot high, right? This $6 area is your first pivot. So now we have what? Triple bottom equal lows, good. Higher pivot high, higher pivot low, and then a 30 minute three bar play. This one, you're gonna ride at 650 by 625. You're gonna ride it back to $9. When it gets to $9, you're gonna take off some of your shares third of your position, half of your position, whatever it may be. And then you're going to see if you can't get it all the way back to 13, depending on your expectation. If you're trying to intraday swing this because you're on a 30 minute chart and you go, you know, this looks really good. Why wouldn't I hold it for a couple few days? Well, then you'd probably take a little bit off perhaps at two to one. This went $1.50, by the way, just FYI. This stock went to $8 the same day. That's $1.50, 25 cents stop. You can do the math. That's six to one on your money. So if you risk $1,000, you could potentially be up six grand on this. Take some off, ride it for the next couple of few days, right? But this was only possible because you knew the market cycle. Other people would be like, nope, no thanks. This stock's really, really weak. There's no buyers in sight. I'm scared of this thing. That's what a fearful person would have said. Person reading the chart properly would have said, oh, wait a second though. It broke the trend line. It retested the bottom, put in a higher high and a higher low, and gave me a really nice three-bar play pattern. Check, 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 check. Let's give it a shot. And with a stop loss, I can only lose one R. Let's give it a go. Okay? Same situation here. Okay? Now, I want, I want to transition slightly, right? We're still talking about cycles, but I want to transition the cycles into the volatile markets that we're currently in. And I think many of you would agree, the volatility we've seen recently has been impressive. I mean, the markets typically do like a, between a one and $3 range, one and $4 range. We're seeing eight, 10, 12, $15 ranges in the queues in this spot. I mean, the volatility is triple, quadruple what we're used to, okay? Now, why is this important? It's important because it makes us reconsider stuff. And what I mean by reconsider is normally when you have a directional market, you can feel comfortable and confident that if you buy a stock that's in a transition or in an uptrend and the market's strong that day, you're going to get paid because the market isn't likely going to do a 100% reversal. Well, that's not the environment in which we're in. The market, flip a coin and the market could be down 150% five, 10 minutes from now. You could literally be up $5 on the SPY. Five minutes later, the SPY is now down $7. Well, what does that do? Well, the vast majority of stocks are somewhat correlated to the market. So if you happen to be in a stock, say you're doing end of the day hold or something like that, you might be up 5R, or 10R, and all of a sudden, at the end of the day, you are down. This is why I put in Starbucks. This is a trade that we took, I took yesterday, I says, right here, watch Starbucks for a buy setup. 84.65 entry area with a wider stop, but we need the market to bounce. 
there is the Starbucks entry. So right over here, the entries on Starbucks. Okay. Now, here's the other rub. Generally speaking, 1130, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, that's a more quiet time in the markets, right? Things settle down over lunch, the big boys go have their, I don't know, their Cipriani lunches, okay, and their Smith and Walensky steaks. At that time, maybe they leave the office, okay. But the point simply is, that's typically a less volatile time. If we draw our trend line, remember micro time frame um, stages, okay, cycles. So we break above the trend line. We retest with a higher low and a higher high and an equal to higher low. So what are we seeing here on a micro time frame? We're seeing a transition. We're seeing a stock that's likely going from a micro stage four downtrend into a likely micro stage two uptrend. Stage four, double, triple bottom retest, stage one. You get that little transition period in the middle and then back up here, probably a stage two. And all was well in the world of Starbucks. The frappuccinos and lattes were flowing, right? I mean, you're in here at like 84.65. The stock goes close to 87. You're going, man, $2.30. It's probably like a 75 cent stop loss, you're going, damn, I'm up 3R. Now, if you did 3R, you probably got paid. But then what happens? Stock comes all the way back, retests, bounces, and then rolls over, puts in, or at least tests the low of the day, and you stop out. How did that happen? You did everything right. You read the trend. You read the cycle. You got in on a proper pattern, on a proper setup with a proper entry and a proper stop loss. But the problem is the markets don't normally do this, right? Markets just don't normally do this. Guys, the SKUs went from 320 to 333. That's a $13 move. That's about a 4% move. I'm going to repeat this. That's a 4% move. Hold on a second. Wait, stay with me. Guys, there are years the market isn't up 4%. Here's one, 4%. Here's one, 2%. 2% right there, okay? Here's a 5% year, all right? Minus 2%. There are years the market doesn't do 4%. The market on this particular day did a 4% move in an hour. You heard me. In one hour, the market bounced 4% off the lows. What? That's extreme volatility. So my point though is, if we take a look over here, the trade was taken at the right time, right? This is the Starbucks trade on the right. This is the market on the left. I mean, you couldn't have timed that trade any better. It was really spectacular. It was a great trade. But I wouldn't have suspected a market that pops $13 is going to give 75% of it back up. I would expect a pullback to here. See the 328 area right there? You see that right there? Circling it? Yeah. A little bottoming tail here, a little reaction. And I think, okay, we're just going to hang around between 328 and the high today. We're just going to stay there. Right? Nope. No thank you. Broke the low, bounced, and broke the low again. What? So where am I going with all of this? Know the environment in which you're trading because it might change your expectations. It might change your trade management. You might say, all right, I used to be an all or nothing trader and I still am. Maybe you're still doing 2R and 2R is okay. But if you're an end of the day hold trader, you might say, you know, I better take some off on the way up if I get 2 or 3R because I don't know if and when the market's going to reverse. And lately, the reversals aren't quiet, small little pullbacks that you can withstand. They are waterfalls. The bounces are huge and the pullbacks are nasty on both sides of the coin. Okay. I would not have suspected this bounce at 320. We're retesting the lows of the day. We look like we're going to go lower and then boom, 20 minutes later, we cut through one pivot, two pivots, three, three pivots, just slice through like hot knife through warm butter, gone. What? And then, oh my gosh, Vladimir Putin comes out and says something, market tanks. Fed comes out and says, oh, instead of a quarter point, it's a half point. Tanks, all right? Oh, we're sanctioning Russian oil. Tanks. That, that's a tough environment. 
geopolitical issues, financial concerns, interest rate concerns, all, everything you can imagine, this perfect storm. So you have a choice there. You can sit on your hands or you can make some adjustments. Okay? So when we look at this, this is a traditional chart that we would read traditionally. And I'm not saying you should read it differently. You should continue to read it the way it is. But you might change your expectation based upon the environments. Okay, so when we look, we went over this chart, gosh, probably a year or two ago. It's been a while since we've gone over this chart. But here's a stock that gaps up, rips higher, and then breaks the low of the day. Right? Breaks support with wide range bars. One, two, two big wide range bars, continues lower, huge bottoming tail. Tradable reversal, it says but. Why is the but there? Does anybody know? It's tradable reversal. It's a big bottoming tail. Why is the but there? Talk to me. Anybody? Why, why would I put that in there? There's a reason for it. It says tradable reversal, but why is that there? Some of you are going, I don't know, Jared, that looks great to me. Yeah, you broke the low of the day, not by a couple few pennies, but by a significant margin, right? I mean, that's the low of the day. And let's be frank here. The buyers were pretty committed early in the day. And then you take out a bottoming tail, two big ass green bars and you just kept going lower the bounce is expected but you know what's also expected talk to me the bounce was expected but what's also expected I'll give you a hint you can say the answer in two letters two letter answer bing bong yanni got it lower high a lower high is absolutely expected and often those lower highs will turn into sell setups. So this lower pivot high was absolutely expected. And then it turned into a sell setup. But the lower high has to happen before the sell setup, right? They can be one in the same sometimes. So then it goes lower, continues lower. So first sell setup after a big reversal is lower odds, don't trade it. I would agree with this, why? Because this stock was strong, we need to be careful. So I'm not saying you can't take it, even though it says don't trade it, but I'm saying be very careful, right? Because typically on a stock that gaps up like this, unless it's climactic or super extended, you know, 15, 20, 30% up, these typically chop a lot, right? They typically chop a lot. So anyway, the stock goes lower. You get a little reaction right here, why? The reaction is the overlapping sideways bars. Why the reaction? Because of the bottoming tail, right? That's where the buyers and sellers are fighting because buyers came in really strong over here, but sellers are clearly in control over here and then buyers and sellers have at it again. Sellers win. Shallow bounce, guess what? That, that's a pretty good sell setup right there. It's not even marked. It's a pretty good sell setup, okay? Short it right there, stop right there. Target's there. The only negative is you don't have a huge target. Breaks the low, starts to come back up. Now, now we have a problem. So slightly aggressive short over here. Possible break down here because you do have a consolidation. I would, I would have preferred a couple more consolidation bars to short this breakdown, but it's a shortable breakdown. Shortable. Drops, bounces, sell set up right here because now we're in multiple lower highs and lower lows. Lower high one, lower high two, lower low one, lower low two, multiple two or more. Okay, so now we're technically in a downtrend. All right, stock goes lower, but this happens. So far, we're really good up until this bottoming tail. Everything's good. You're like, hey, this chart's doing what we expect it to do. Starts to come back up. So far, not a huge problem. This is a problem. A 100% retest of the prior pivot and technically a higher high. Not by much, but a higher high. This is a problem. What happened to all the sellers? This, this is not a significant new low. It's a peekaboo low. Peekaboo lows mean buyers are stepping up sooner than we expected them, sooner than they should have. This stock should have chopped around a little, like that little bottoming tail, and then it should have gone lower. It did not. Read the chart. Don't put your opinion onto the chart, just read the chart. It's telling you what it's saying, right? So 
After this semi-equal low, yes, it's a lower low, but it's not a significant lower low, then what happens? We break above the trend line. Now we have two problems. We did not put in a significant new low, and we just broke above the trend line. Things are starting to get dicey. Pretty soon, we're going to have a third problem. And that third problem is we broke above the prior pivot high. That's a big, 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 big problem. So again, I'll repeat. Problem one, we did not put in a significant new low. Problem two, we broke above the trend line. Problem three, we put in a higher high slash equal high. One, you would have already stopped out of your sell setup. But the point all of this is leaning towards is stock is finished going lower. That's, that's the message you're taking here. We are no longer going lower. Now I want to see what? Preferably what? Two things I want to see, but one's preferable over the other. What do I want to see? After all those three things that I just told you about, what do I want to see now over here? What do I want to see? Talk to me. Show me you're paying attention. Right here, where my cursor is. What do I want to see? Ferrom. A higher low. I want to, we already got it. Guys, how could the answer be a higher high? We just came from a higher high. Right? Why would the answer be a higher high when that's exactly what we just came from? What do I want to see after the higher high? My cursor was sitting right there. You saw it. it was sitting right there. Okay. After the higher high, you want to see a higher low. You want to see the buyers step up earlier, sooner. Because over here, the chart is telling us buyers are coming in. Right? Weak new low, buyers are stepping up. Break of the trend line, buyers are stepping up. Higher high, buyers are stepping up. Confirm to me that the buyers are still committed. Put in a higher low. Put in a higher low. Show me you're committed. Don't tell me, show me. Well, in this case, technically, not by much, it puts in a higher low, right? It didn't put in a new low, it put in a slightly, not by much, not by much. Put in a higher low. Bounces, retest, another higher low. Now, what can we say? Now, do I wanna buy this here? That's debatable. Right? It's an aggressive area to buy. But I can tell you, the odds of this bouncing are significant because of everything we just learned. Do I wish it put in a, a more significant higher low? Yes, I, of course, of course I do. But it didn't. Retested, put in a big green bar. Retested, put in a big green bar. So now you know, when this stock gets past this red line, you better look for that first entry. Perfect world, perfect world. What would we want to see happen right here, guys? In a perfect world, talk to me right here. See my cursor, it's on the last green bar. What do I want to see in the future? Over the next four to five green bars, what do I want to see? Or not green bars, any bars. Over the next four or five bars, what do I want to see? That's it. Farone, again, you want to see a break of the red line, which we got and then a higher low at the new support. So let's do this, let's do this. Let's take this, do this. That's what I wanna see. I want to see, okay? I wanna see this pull back to the red line, give me an opportunity to buy and rip. I wanna see a pull back to the red line, give me an opportunity, bottoming tail, doji bar and rip. And my first target is going to be way over here, up here, this pivot, first target, second target, way up here. That, that's the market cycle. That is a real chart showing, where are we have 15, showing what we talked about earlier, which I wish I could find the slide, but showing this. It's all we're seeing. And it doesn't matter if that's a monthly chart or a one minute chart. It's all we're seeing. We're seeing these things, okay? but in a chart-based form, things that really happen, okay? So, changing gears slightly, but on the same topic. Yesterday, SPWR ripped. We took this trade 16, 1860 by 1820, okay? I made a little bit of money, like seven or 800 bucks, not that much money. This stock went like seven, eight, nine R. Why am I bringing this up? bring this up because i want you guys to not get caught up in this okay trust me it all ties together give me a moment 
This was a really nice pattern. It was a three bar play initially, right? See it on the three minute, three bar play. And then it had a shakeout. Beautiful little shake, right? And then it ripped. But yesterday we saw insane levels of volatility, like crazy levels of volatility. And we saw what happened to some of the other trades we saw. We looked at Starbucks, for example, was looking great and then finished the day at the low. SPWR was on its own page completely and utterly. But when the market tanks, even stocks on their own page will usually pull in. So what am I teaching you? What's the lesson? I don't want you guys, as much as I love relative strength and relative weakness, and it's still what we search for on every trade. It is, okay? But I don't want you guys just getting caught up in just that. Meaning, if we're in an extreme volatile market, you might want to change to pivot management. Because... Yes, while SPWR did a great job holding up to the market yesterday, that's not going to be the normal situation. You could have been up 3R on SPWR, just like we were on Starbucks, and boom, the market comes in, that huge, let's see, where, where can I find that at? Was it here? Nope, wasn't there. Wasn't there. There, right? This massive pullback on the Qs could have happened and drugged that stock down with it. And all of a sudden, your 2 or 3R disappears. So what I'm trying to tell you is, even though this stock has tremendous, I mean, really tremendous relative strength, try to protect some on the way up in these types of environments. And look, if we're talking about an environment where there's volatility for a day or two or a week, that's different. This has been a three-month period of volatility, right? I'll give you that. Every once in a while, we're caught off guard, right? Market changes on a dime here or there, and we're like, oh, shoot. But this isn't that. This has been three months now. If you haven't adjusted to this environment, something's wrong. Okay, something's wrong. Here's another example. You guys remember DVN? Yesterday is also. This stock started a day like gangbusters. I mean, it went from 60 to 63, which is a big move for this thing. Right? So if you went long, I'm not saying there's a great entry here. Right? But if you found an entry on this thing, for the first hour and a half of the day, you were just sitting back like, here, hold my beer. I'm the man. Hold my beer. In fact, give me a shot of tequila while you're at it. You know what? Just give me the bottle. That's what you were thinking. That didn't last very long. Look at this move. Right? Why? Energy sector is crazy right now. Crazy with everything that's going on in the geopolitical events. Right? Would have been kind of nice to protect some of those profits, huh? You know, maybe a pivot right there, move your stop. Maybe a pivot right there, move your stop. So when this happens, you're not stopping out and you've even locked in some profits. Now, we can talk about the climactic buy setup. That's a different conversation. I am talking about for the folks, because I know there were some folks in the chat room that got in this, because you mentioned it to me, sent me messages. Jared, what should my target be on DVN? Well, you had a nice thing going, a really great thing going but it didn't last all that long, right? You would have stopped out big time no matter what your stop loss was right here. So to watch profits like that disappear when you're up three, four, five R can be very painful. Yep, SBSW did the same thing because of the environment we're in. It's not typical, it's not normal, but these aren't normal times, okay? So point is this. I'm going to like, I'm going to move this to swing and core trading, investing, as well as intraday trading. This slide's going to encompass all of those things. Okay. One, <clears throat> never panic. Never, ever panic. And honestly, you really shouldn't because your plan should have a modus operandi for when just about anything happens. Every once in a while, you get caught out. We all do. Shit happens, right? Okay. So big picture, when the market rolls over 10, 20, 30%, don't panic, get greedy. In fact, I should say that. Hold on, let me, let me change this for a second. Don't panic, get greedy, all right? Now, remember, I'm talking about longer-term investments here. I am not talking, I want to be very clear because some of you will take this the wrong way. I'm not talking about if a trade goes past your stop loss. No, don't get greedy and start buying up a losing 
position. That's just stupid. I'm talking about your 10, 20, 30 year portfolio. Your portfolio that you're not gonna touch for 10 years. That's the stay calm, don't panic, get greedy. When the market tanks 20%, buy it all up. Just buy it up. Okay, but your trades, take your stop losses. You always take your stop losses. Know your levels, not no, it should be K. N-O-W, that's better, Jerry. All right, know your levels, support and resistance. And this, this isn't just investing. This is everywhere. This is a one minute chart. This is a monthly chart, a yearly chart. Know where your trend line is, know where your support is, know where your resistance is. Guys, if you ever get into a trade and don't know those levels, you shouldn't be in that trade, right? If you ever get into a trade and you find like, you know what? I didn't know where my support and resistance levels were. You shouldn't be in it. And that should happen very rarely. Every once in a while, maybe you get into a five minute trade and the weekly chart has you know, massive resistance or something, you didn't see it. Okay, but it shouldn't happen very often, okay? Have a plan, entry, exit, and management, all right? Have a plan. If you don't have a plan, you're just a gambler. Most of you are, or you think you have a plan, but don't follow it, or you say you have a plan, but it's not written down. That's a problem. Be greedy when others are fearful. Okay, that's kind of the don't panic, get greedy. Be greedy when others are fearful. Guess what, guys? Go back, hold on for it. I think it was at this one. The average person is really fearful down here. They really are. The average person is really fearful over here. Okay? You need to be greedy AF. Wait for a pattern. Don't just randomly jump in. But the average person is scared shitless on this way down. This is the pain threshold. Oh no, not another leg lower. They're doing all their homework, reading all their fundamentals, seeing who the CEO is, what's the next earnings, blah, blah, blah. What's the credit risk of the company, blah, blah, blah. You need to be licking your chops like a shark going, okay, show me, show me my checklist. Ooh, equal low, check one. Ooh, break of the trend line, check two. Higher high, ooh, check three. Equal high or low, check four. You should be checking it off, going greedy, 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 greedy. Don't be scared, just read the chart. There's nothing to be scared of, especially if you have an entry stop target. There's nothing to be scared of, okay? Then, be flexible. I know, you need to have a specific detailed plan, but if you find yourself a couple weeks in, it might take you a couple weeks to adjust, maybe even a month from time to time, but you find yourself going, man, this market's got me by the short hairs. I'm pretzel tied. You know, I'm, I'm getting up an hour, hour and a half, and then the market's just poof, reversing. Consider for that period of time, a month or two, raising your stops or selling half, maybe going in, in portions, half lots, third lots, right? Now, if you're not struggling and the market's volatile, then don't do anything. If the market's volatile and somehow your plan is doing great, don't touch it. Let it go, right? Know the market always goes up. This is to the long, the long-term traders. Stay calm, don't panic. This is not an excuse to be stupid, right? Meaning, if you have a stop loss on a long-term position, take your stop. But if you're investing 10, 20, 30 years out, the market always goes up, always. And if you don't believe me, this should. Guys, December 31st. 1983. The Dow was at 1,046. Somebody type in what the Dow is at today. I can see it right now. I could tell you, but just type it in for shits and giggles for me. Go ahead. Do it. Type it in. What's the Dow at today? Anyone? You don't have the Dow up? Is that 333? Is that 33,000? I'm seeing 33,345, 346, 347, 346, 33,348. I don't know, guys. That's a long ways from 1,046, isn't it? Heck, wait for it. Heck, hold on for it. Wait for it. 2019, December 31st, it was at 23,000. It's almost 50% higher in the last two years. 50 freaking percent. But I'm scared. It was down in 2018. I need to get out. 
Guys, 39 years later, the market's up 33-fold. 39 years later, the market's up 33-fold. Think about that. Just think about that. So when I go back and I say to you, the market always goes up. It's a factually accurate statement. It's just the question is, what's your timeline? What's your timeline? If you have 10 plus years, it always goes up. There might be a decade in, the, in history where you look back 10 years and it's down over that decade. But it almost always goes up. So don't be so fearful. Be greedy when you see the market pull back 10, 20, 30%. And to end this off and to close this out, you saw the same quote last week and I liked it enough. I put it back in. Remember, our enemy is not lack of preparation. It's not the difficulty of the project or the state of the marketplace or the emptiness of our bank account. The enemy is our chattering brain, which if we give it so much as a nanosecond, will start producing excuses, alibis, transparent justifications, and a million reasons why we can't, shouldn't, won't do what we need to do. Do not let fear dominate your decision making. Your fear of loss for many of you is stronger than your hope for gain. Okay? Have a plan, execute the plan, and let the chips fall where they may. All right? So, I hope that you guys learned a little bit about the current market levels that we're in, and we will definitely come back in two years and see where are we. Maybe we'll be lower, but there's a real good chance we'll be higher. Even though the last three years in the market have been obscenely good, the market compounded is up 100% in the last three years. All right? But I hope you learned a little bit about those levels. Hope you learned a little bit about transitions, market cycles, okay, and where you need to be and how you should be thinking when you're in those certain areas, as well as being calm, just relaxing, not going crazy, not losing your you-know-what when things don't go exactly how you plan. When the market does pull in, look at it as an opportunity. Don't look at it as a negative, okay? So I'm Jared Wesley of Live Traders. We'll get back at it again next week.